I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you, and even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous provided the purpose is good and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Man does not give by, live by bread alone. Thank you, David, for reading for us this morning from God's Word. And uh, we are continuing our study in the book of Galatians. Looking at, you know, there's no other gospel. You know, when we think about what is God calling us to believe, the good truth, the good news, there's just one. And, you know, Paul's been laboring to show that to the Galatians. He's afraid that they're going to abandon the gospel and then abandon God himself and lose out on finding life and having inheritance so timely for us today because there's so many messages, you know, that are around us. So many things that are calling us to invest ourselves into a certain product, into a certain belief, into a certain way of life. And so we have to be really thoughtful about what is it that we believe, what is it that we're living for. And what you heard today from Galatians 4 was a parent's concern for his kids. A parent's concern for his kids. I think about when I was 12, I was talking with uh, Esther this morning, and she said that she started working when she was 12, 13. And what's interesting is I also started working when I was 12, not by choice. I, my mom came to the middle school, picked me up, and I thought I was going home to play some video games and eat some snacks and relax. What I found out was I was on my way to my uncle's uh, mechanic shop, and I was going to put in my first day of work. And I remember, I mean, you would think it was the exorcist. I, that's probably what my mom thought. I went crazy. You know, I just was so irate. You know, how could you? And I knew my uncles. You know, my, I was going to go work for my uncles. And I knew how hard they push, you know, to work. I grew up in a family. Maybe you grew up in this type of family where having a hard work ethic was at the top of the list. And so you were going to get pushed. I mean, I, I'm 12. My uncle is in his 30s and he was an amateur boxer always really took care of himself and it was always let's see who can carry more steel you know who was going to carry more steel not I wasn't I, right I was always going to lose out in that competition but he pushed me and he pushed me and I grew up around people and I'm sure you did too folks who really wanted to invest in you people who really cared about you parents you know the reason my mom took me to work was she cared about me. I didn't see it at that time. I thought she hated me. <laughs> but she didn't hate me. She wanted to invest in me, and she knew, I want to, I want to give him a good work ethic. And parents, we, we can want that. I, I meet so many people, and I, I probably think you're like this here too. I want my life 
the summation of it to be that I invest in other people. I help to enrich their lives. I help to make them better. I want that for my life. And often what happens, though, is people, man, they have their own will. Isn't that hard? They can decide and choose to do something other than what we, you know, see. And, and, and maybe we see something really good and, and we're calling them to that. But they have a choice and there's some anguish there. I, I see that play out all the time with parents and their kids. Uh, we want this for you. We want to invest in you. We want to do good to you. But the, but the child, maybe you've had this. You see your kids walking in a direction that you don't want them to walk down. Our grandparents, you see your grandkids walk in a direction. Maybe you, you say, man, I know the direction. I know where they're heading and it's not good. And I want to keep them from it. But they keep going that way. There's no way, right, short of doing something illegal like locking them in their bedroom. Even then, right, they're going to escape through the window. And so you, you, want, you want this, but they have, they have a choice, and it could cause such anguish in your heart. How many parents here, grandparents, you felt anguish over your kids or grandkids, a choice that they've made, a decision that wasn't what you knew was best for them, what would really help them? Uh, I see this also play out in friendships. You're in, I, I've seen it play out in my own friendships where you want your friends to succeed you want them to be the best version that they can be of themselves you want them to excel but you see them making bad decisions and poor choices and you're trying to help them but they push aside your advice anybody here you've been in that situation where maybe they've pushed aside your advice or maybe you're the one that's pushing aside the advice there's joy and pain in friendships, right? Joy and pain. That's what we're going to look at this morning, I think, what we see here. Sometimes we're on the other end of these relationships. We're the folks who need help. There are some shortcomings. We're heading in the wrong direction, and people are trying to help us to steer us back to a path that's good. Sometimes that's, that's us. We're not the only ones calling other people to a place that's good, that's healthy for them. Sometimes we need that ourselves. But we can push away advice. We can push away help. There's probably multiple reasons for that. But one of the reasons is we can be prideful. We can think we, we don't want to hear correction. There's a reason why the Proverbs are filled with the refrain that the foolish person hates rebuke and correction, but the wise person loves it. It's because we can push away that. You know, we, we really want to know what's right and what's best. We really chase after this idea of perfection, but we fall short. We might need maturity in the way that we think, in the way that we live. And when we think about that maturity from the Bible standpoint, from what Scripture has to say, it's Christ formed in you. When we talk about maturity, when we talk about growing, it's Christ formed in you. Every Christian in here, you need a mentor. You need someone discipling you. You cannot do the Christian life alone. Every single Christian in here Every single Christian outside of here, all around the globe, every single Christian needs a local church, a biblical community to help. Because, you know, we struggle. We struggle with Christ being formed in us. We are called to be both disciples and disciplers. Both, there's two sides of that coin, and we all are called to that life. Think about Jesus' command. What does he say? Go and make disciples. Yes, he was talking to the original disciples, but he's talking to every disciple of his. Everyone who has decided to follow Christ, Jesus has transformed you into a disciple maker. 
That's his calling, his command for your life. It's not a great suggestion. It's the great commission, the great sending. And so we, we got to do it individually, but then every church is called to go and make disciples and to baptize them and to teach them to observe all that Christ has commanded. Sometimes, though, we can't control. You can't control if someone is discipling you. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you thought, I wish somebody would really invest into me. I feel like I keep giving out. And I I wish somebody would pour into my life. You can't control that aspect. But what you can control is, are you going to disciple? Are you going to pour into others? Are you going to follow Jesus' way of living that we see here played out with Paul? Caring for others. Take a look at verse 19 of chapter 4 in Galatians. He says that he is once again in the anguish of childbirth until what? Christ is formed in you. When we're, so this is the, the big idea here is Christ formed in you. That's discipleship, really caring for others. That idea formed, it's the idea of development and what Paul wants you to think about here the analogy that's behind it is a person that is taking shape and developing in the womb. So think about the stages of a person developing in the womb. There are stages to it. This is the idea of Christ being formed in you. The same way that a baby is formed in the womb, Christ ought to be forming and taking shape in you. So God's will for your life is not just that you go to heaven. That is part of his will for your life. But his will for your life is that Christ be formed in you. Take shape. Just as a baby develops in the womb, Christ ought to develop in you. And we're going to look at more of what that means here. So Paul's desire, what he's laboring toward, the end to which he's gone is Christ formed in them. And I think this is, a, this is a good point because we're going to be talking about a lot about caring for others or the word that's often used is discipleship. So what are we laboring toward when we think about caring for other people? And I've been around enough people to know that some folks, it's just that this person be the best version of themselves. Or that they have a successful life. But the reason, Christian, why we labor, the end to which we're pointed, is that Christ would really take shape and develop in a person. That they know Jesus and they're growing to be like him. So when you think about Jesus' command to go and make disciples, that's the end to which you're laboring. Christ forming in them. Let's continue the Bible's analogy here of a person developing in the womb. Before a person begins to develop in the womb, what has to happen first? Conception. I heard somebody say it. Same way here. Let's continue with the analogy. If Christ is to take shape in you or in others, there has to be spiritual conception. So does the Bible help us in some way to understand spiritual conception. What's that look like? And the good news is it does. Remember the parable of the sower and the seeds. So imagine a farmer, seeds in his hand, and he's scattering those seeds, and the seeds fall onto rich soil and sprout. That's what we're talking about, conception occurring it happens when those gospel seeds fall onto the heart the rich soil and that sprouting happens because the holy spirit begins to use that message and convicts us and brings us to a place of repentance and belief and then by faith alone 
That person hears the message and responds. They receive and rest in Jesus as he's offered to us in the gospel. And new life happens. Conception occurs. This is what we're talking about with spiritual birth. And that has to happen with every person. With ourselves and with, with those, if they are to know Christ, if they're to have relationship, if Christ is to be formed in them. And so our labor field, imagine, continuing with the analogy, you're a farmer. That's what Jesus is calling you to do. He's calling you to be a spiritual farmer, scattering seed, toiling, watering. And we talked about it. If you go out here out of the south, outside the lobby, you'll see a big banner that says, pray, care, share, disciple. So you're praying for others. You're caring for them in tangible ways, just like Jesus did. You're sharing the gospel with them, investing into the life. That's you out in the field as a farmer tilling the soil. That's what we're called to. Like Jesus, I want to encourage you to invest in the lives of non-Christians. What was Jesus accused of? Being a friend of who? Sinners. Be friends with sinners. <laughs> you can't just be friends with people who are holy and cleaned up. You know, we got to invest in the people who are around us, our neighbors, our co-workers. Be friends with them. Get to know them. Live life with them. Change oil with them. Play basketball with them. Something that's important to recognize is that in the West, winning people to Christ is, takes a long, long time. So you are, not, <laughs> you are probably not going to be like, I'm going to go make a disciple, and then tomorrow you're going to have a chance to preach the gospel, and people are going to say, I respond in faith, I believe, you know, and I want to be baptized. It's probably not going to happen. Those days are gone. In the West, it takes time to build those friendships. And so it's all right if you're building those friendships and it's a while before you get to a place where, you know, I can really share the gospel in a way that helps them to understand. You might, you might do it in pieces and not all at once, but you're pouring into the lives of others. We're called, we're called to plant and to water but who is it that gives growth? God. That's his business. It's really crucial that we understand what our responsibility is. Our responsibility is to scatter the seed. It's to water, to plant, but it's God who gives the growth. And once you get that squared away, then you don't have the pressure of converting people. You don't have the pressure of making them a Christian. That's God's business. I'm just called to faithfully scatter seed, water, plant, love them for Christ. There is deep and profound joy in caring for other people. Paul experienced this. He talks about, in verse 19, he calls the Galatians my little children. So when we think about investing into other people's lives, we should think in terms of parenting being a spiritual parent, caring for children. It's really affectionate. His language that he uses here, very warm and caring. He calls them brothers and sisters and children, my little children. You hear how warm and caring that language is? Caring for others equals truth set in very affectionate, loving relationships. I think the contrast to this, I've heard people say before, look, I'm just a truth teller. I just speak it the way it is. Can I just say, I think that that's a cover and a poor excuse for not loving people well. Right? God will never call you to sacrifice love for truth will never call you to sacrifice love for truth. Those two things go together like cheese and wine. They belong together, love and truth. The apostle had such joy in caring for the Galatians 
And it was evidenced how, by his affirmation, he affirmed them. As you see Christ develop, this is a crucial part of caring for other people. As you see Christ developing in them, as you see them making really good choices, moving in the way that God's will is for for them, take time and affirm that. Solidify the gains for them. That helps them solidify gains. We can be really good at critiquing ourselves and critiquing others. But we are called to affirm, to see the good that God is up to and taking time and saying, hey, I just want to let you know I'm seeing this good choice that you're making in your life. I'm seeing what God's doing in your life, and it just is so exciting. I'm so excited about that. We do that for children. <laughs> you know, my, my you know, kids, they will make a picture for me. It's not going to hang up at the Philadelphia Art Museum, but I praise it. Yeah, it's such a great job the way that you're drawing. I love how you're staying in the lines. I love you know, the colors that you're putting here. I love how you've, you know, put fingers now on, on hands. People are more proportional. You know, so we get really specific about our affirmation. And why does that stop? Why do we stop affirming people just because they reach a certain age? Shouldn't that continue throughout all of our lives? We're affirming people, praising them, giving thanks for the work that God's doing in them. And I'm not talking about flattery, because that's what these false teachers were doing. They were just full of flattery, talking about genuine affirmation. That's part of caring for other people. Paul affirmed their joyful service. He affirmed their meeting needs sacrificially. He affirmed their heart of love and concern. He affirmed their reception of the gospel at first. He he also affirmed how they honored leaders and cared for them. So five ways that I identify that Paul took time to affirm them. I want you this week, find, you know, the, the people in your life, look for five ways you can affirm them this week. You know, you see them making progress in Christ, really growing and developing, making good choices, Take time, affirm them, praise them for five things. Say, man, that's that's great. You're doing awesome. Paul does write to correct. He writes to warn. He writes to teach them, but also to affirm. And I thought about this. Affirmation is another way. You can go about it in terms of, at times we need rebuke and correction. But affirmation is just a positive way of teaching people. So you can go at it from either way. But people respond really well to affirmation. So I encourage you to go in that way. Get involved and care for others. And it's so rewarding. (laughs) It's so rewarding when you care for others and you see them making progress. Isn't there joy in that? Think about, you know, for, for you parents, grandparents, when you first saw them take steps, How exciting was that? You were there for it. It's the same way in discipleship. It's really joyful when you're investing in people and you see them growing. You get to be there for that journey. There's great joy, but there's also pain in caring for others. I don't think that probably needs to be said. Everybody's probably had some anguish in caring for somebody else. Paul compares it to labor. I was there for labor. I did not have to go through labor. And so, but being a bystander, being somebody who was there holding Sarah's hand, I, you know, I I can relate now to what Paul's saying. Labor, you know, there's pain, there's anguish there. But you're, you're going forward because you know at the end of that pain, there's rich reward. The child is born. You get to hold that baby. Paul's in labor. He's in anguish for the Galatians. 
Helping Christ be formed or take shape in others is really laborious and painful. There's relational and emotional pain that's there. For them, their relationship was really good, but then it kind of turned sour. There was opposition. They started to consider Paul an enemy for sharing the truth. In your life, if you think about friends, if you think about family members, have you ever had a really good relationship with them, but then all of a sudden, because you shared truth in love, you found yourself maybe as an enemy? Or there was some distance that was created because of that? There's emotional pain that comes with caring for other people. Because as we said, we, we as sinners, we don't, we don't respond well to truth. Our pride kicks in. We distance ourselves. We become hostile. We start to oppose it. And that can happen as we're caring for other people and helping to invest in their lives. Paul, as a, as a parent, is speaking truth, but now finds some distance and coldness there. But it doesn't stop Paul from sharing truth in love with them and gentleness. And I encourage us to follow his example. Don't let a person's response to you sharing truth and love stop you from sharing truth. You know, we, Paul here, we should not only follow his example, but that was really Jesus' example. He continued to share truth, and eventually that took him to a place where they treated him as an ultimate enemy, hunt him up on a cross to die, sacrificed him. And so it shouldn't stop us from caring for others in that way. Caring for others, and we see this right at the beginning. Paul says, I'm entreating you, I'm urging you, I'm pleading with you to come in a certain direction, a healthy direction. So it got me thinking, who am I and who are you urging and pleading with in your life? Is there someone that you just have a heart for and you have a heart for God's truth and you're urging and pleading with them to walk with God, to know him, to delight in him, for Christ to be formed in them. We should have people like that in our lives, that we, we feel that way toward. And then, you know, but what are we entreating them toward? What, to what end? To do what? Is it just to be a good person, or is it to really follow God's will for their lives? Because we understand that's best, that's good for them. And so that entreating, that urging has a, an end. That they would know Christ, know the gospel, and Christ would be formed in them. And the reason that we do this is because we realize what's at stake. That if a person doesn't come to believe and trust in Jesus, if they don't learn to receive him and walk with him, they're cut off from the author of life. They're cut off from the source. Jesus calls him the bread of life or the well that never runs dry, this living water. We recognize that it's like life and death. And so that's, you know, what's at stake is their spiritual well-being. They're good. That's why we're involved in this work. God, just as God will never have you sacrifice love for truth, God will never call you to sacrifice truth for love. So they go together like road, music, like road trips and music, right? Those two things go together. Truth and love go together. So our goal is Christ formed in others, developing in them, taking shape in them. And the Galatians needed Paul to be involved in their lives, to speak truth to them. We need other Christians to, to help us to see when we've kind of ventured off the path and we need to be called back onto God's path. Wise people listen to correction, but the fool closes his ears. How do we, how do we spot maybe when people venture off? Maybe how, how do we spot 
departure, gospel departure. Well, it happens when we begin to listen to and live, I think, purely moralistic good lives. Like that's, that's really what we want. Apart from knowing God and enjoying him, we just want to be good people. And I think that's the message of our culture is to do good, to, to be good. And, but there's no, there's no God involved with that, knowing God and enjoying him. And so we can start to venture off, and that was happening for the Galatians, starting to rely on their own good works, them being good people apart from the work that Christ has done for them. And we could spot, we could spot this departure in people's lives in their lack of love and joyful service to gospel leaders and teaching. There's a lack of joy in the gospel. And Paul spotted that in them. He said, where's your guys' happiness? Like, what happened to that joy? Where did it go? We should have joy. It should cause us joy to think about what Jesus has done for us and what that means. That we don't have to rely on being really good people, but we can rely on Jesus, that he did enough for us, that he secured our salvation, that he was good enough And so it's not up to my own efforts to clear the bar. But Jesus has already cleared the bar for me. He's already made me accepted in God. And it's based off of what he has done and not what I've done. And that should give us some joy. That should give us some joy, some things to celebrate about. Does the gospel make you happy and motivate you to live sacrificially? Or does your happiness derive from your performance of God's commands? Does your happiness come from like the good merit badges you're earning? Or does your happiness and joy come from Jesus? He's your trophy. He's your hero. And so where where does it come from, yourself or from him? And we can usually spot it in joy, the lack of joy that comes over the gospel. So we're called to labor for the spiritual good of others. And this involves the work of making disciples. Discipleship is really about the art, you could say, of imitation. Paul says in verse 12, if you look, chapter 4, he says, become as I am. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this, he says, imitate me, as I imitate Christ. Isn't that kind of bold? But that's what discipleship is. Discipleship fundamentally is the art of imitation. Actors do really, they, they do impressions. And I don't know if you've ever seen Bill Hader, famous comedian, he does great impressions. But they could take on a person. You know, their voice and their mannerisms. And you're like, oh, I could see who that is. You know, people love to do Jack Nicholson. I could see Jack Nicholson. You know, he's doing a really good job with it. The difference, though, is that actor will put that impression on and then take it off. We're not putting Christ on and then taking Christ off, but allowing him to develop in us. Imitation is essential. Disciples follow disciplers, and mentees follow mentors. And what that involves for us is if you're going to disciple, if you're really going to follow Jesus' command, you're going to have to get uncomfortable because you need to be willing to be intimate with others and vulnerable. If you can't be intimate and vulnerable with others, you're going to have a hard time discipling. Because you're not going to be able to get real with people. Show them how Jesus is not just the hero of their story, but the hero of your story. How God can not only meet their needs, but how God is meeting your needs. And so imitation is crucial And it's best done, Paul says here, he says, I wish I could be with you guys like face to face and talk to you. 
Discipleship is best done face to face. We, you know, Peter, he gave great examples of it. And, and it's, we, we, we tend to think of discipleship as a 10-week course at a church or something. I remember I met with uh, one of our high schoolers up until he was a college student for three years. And before I left Richmond, it was like a couple meetings before I left Richmond, he said, Paul, I just realized for the past three years, you've been discipling me. He didn't realize it for three years, but that had started, and it started with us meeting for breakfast. And it wasn't like I did a Bible study necessarily, but I just heard about what was going on in his life, and I tried to match those needs and struggles with what I was reading in Scripture and what God was doing in my life. That's discipleship. It doesn't have to be ultra-fancy. You don't have to be certified. You don't have to go to seminary. And you don't have to know all the answers. You could say, I don't know the answers to your question. Or I wish I could help you. Or you might just say, I feel like all I can do for you right now is just pray. Can we just pray together? That's discipleship. This is what God's calling us to. Later in Galatians 6 1, Paul says this. He says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Paul's modeling that for them right now. And Christ modeled this way of life for us. He came to restore us with gentleness. We have to practice what we read here this morning and what's being modeled for us. Why? This, this is... Uh, my last part, but it's probably the most crucial part here. Why is it so important for us to get this? The reason why it's so important for us to get this as a church and as Christians is, is I believe our failure to have lived out what Paul, Paul's modeling for us here, our failure to do this, is what's led to the church's decline and stagnation. And the reason is because we can, we can care more about numbers. We can care more about programs. We can care more about performance. We can care more about buildings than actually discipling others. We want to program it. But discipleship, look at Jesus, he never threw a program. He never threw a VBS but he discipled people. So we're talking about a way of living. And if we fail to embrace what we're reading here, what Paul's doing, the church will continue to decline and stagnate. What is a disciple? We have to go back. We need to take a break from all that noise and refocus on the basics. What is a disciple? How can we be a good disciple? And how do we make disciples? This is a question that we need to, you know, we need to ask this, these questions as a community and answer them as a community. There's such joy and there's such pain in caring for others, but we're called to labor for the spiritual good of other people. So I encourage you, don't give up. Keep loving, caring, speaking God's truth. Keep seeking for Christ to be formed and others, and develop and take shape in them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning opportunity to consider the pain and the joy of caring for other people, of seeing Christ take form in them, to develop in them, and take shape in them. God, we, we pray that that would happen for us that Christ would develop and take shape in our attitudes we see Jesus he did not come to serve or to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many I pray that that attitude would become our attitude his attitude would develop and take shape in our lives now we can't do this just by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps it's really this, your spirit at work in us. We pray for the Holy Spirit.
to really do his work, clean house, transform us. God, we put ourselves underneath your care, underneath your discipleship. We, we just, we're praying that we would have a true heart of love for you and devotion for you, a de- love and a devotion for others, that we would speak truth and love and care for them well, for your glory and for their good. Amen.